It's Monday, July 3. In the headlines, a $428 million grant for JCF. In business news, we take a look at Angelith James from personal and professional development company, Genexco. Regionally, Antiguan Prime Minister says some CARICOM countries are acting to destroy Liat. Internationally, Russia's Wagner Group halts recruitment after mutiny. And in sports, reggae boys beat St. Kitts 5-0 in Gold Cup. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Officers of the Jamaica Constabulary Force will soon have use of five ambulances and 33 pickups through funding from a $428 million grant. The government of Japan has signed off on the funds to help boost the mobility of the Jamaica Constabulary Force. The money is being provided through Japan's economic and social development. During a signing ceremony on Friday, June 30, Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Dr. Nigel Clark, pointed out that Japan has been a dependable and long-standing partner of Jamaica and has supported the country's development in several areas. The ambulances will be used to support emergency relief activities by the JCF's Medical Services Branch to transport sick, and or injured members of the force. One unit will be deployed to each of the JCF's five areas. The standing orders of the Senate have been amended to include the terms of reference for the Caucus of Women Parliamentarians. The motion was approved during the sitting of the Upper House on Friday. Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith, said the role of the bicameral caucus involves a similarly established committee of the lower house. As it, rights are eroded elsewhere in the world, and we see rights being strengthened here, with even starting with the public sector leading the way in terms of maternity leave and the family leave, that is the adoption and paternity leave. Uh, you know, that's how it started with equal pay as well. We started with pre-independence, Bustamante's announcement of equal pay within the public service, and then equal pay was then legislated later in the 1970s. Uh, so it's important for governments to lead, and it's important for parliaments to lead. And the role that we, uh, that we take on the duty, indeed, as Senator Allen said, will be to not only have the tough conversations, have the easy conversations, but to engage the population, to widen understandings, to have women and girls and men and boys more understand the value that diverse opinions bring to leadership. In her remarks, Government Senator Shireen Golding Campbell said that the caucus is important in giving focus to the issues facing women and the various legislative and policy initiatives that pass through Parliament. So we all, you know, as mothers, um, women who are mothers, have to, to battle different things and this caucus is, is, is well placed to treat with some of these issues, to bring some awareness and to assist us in looking at national solutions for how we deal with those issues. Opposition Senator Janice Allen welcomed the motion. As a woman parliamentarian in this time, if we were to turn back the hands of time just a few decades, it would not be the numbers that we're seeing today that is represented in both houses of parliament. And the commitment of this committee or this caucus to ensure networking and solidarity around critical issues relating to women in this country, it goes without saying that there is importance to work and the need to work across party lines. 
The National Housing Trust, NHD's external mortgage financing program, takes full effect in August, and contributors will still be able to access benefits directly from the institution. Assistant General Manager for Corporate Communication and Public Affairs, Dwayne Burbick, addressed the matter at a JIS think tank. Earlier this year, the trust introduced the EMFP. It will replace the JFMP, giving customers a wider pool of financial institutions to conduct business with, including banks, credit unions, and building societies. Where I do believe that across the board, all our loan product offerings will see an improvement as it relates to the, num the amount of financing contributors will be able to access through the NHD. Under this new arrangement, contributors will be able to apply for their NHD benefits from the Trust's financial partners. We've made improvements to our online systems to include moving the process of applying for eligibility letters from a manual one where customers were previously required to visit an NHD office or send an email to an NHD customer contact representative. You know, the three pay slips, uh, NIS, TRN, all that information. We've removed that system and simplified it to a new NHD online eligibility portal where all that information is already in the pool of information that the NHD has for for our contributors. Mr. Burbick says this will enable the NHT to provide more housing units in a faster period. Time now for the business report with Denida Rodney. Do you think you're in need of a little personal and professional development? Well, this week's young boss, Angelise James of Genesca, has made it her mission to help you with just that. My name is Angelise James and my company is called Genesca. So we deal with a lot of personal and professional development. We provide coaching as well as consultation services for individuals who want to expand, improve, strategize, just to get you to your next level so you can operate at your best. I did my master's in clinical psychology and I noticed that everybody was doing the same thing and I wanted to do something different. So in my undergrad years, I did psychology and marketing, and I saw how the two came together to complement each other. And the more reading I did, I realized that coaching is essentially the segue between business and therapy to get the individuals to meet their goals at a faster rate rather than slow progress. <laughs> so it's more of a relationship, a partnership, in the sense that the client and the coach, they work together hand in hand as they try to utilize different techniques and strategies to reach a common goal. It's been very welcoming. So individuals who hear about the different ideas, hear about our plans, what it is that we actually offer, they are, tend to be very warm and inviting and willing to engage and hear more. So it's all about exposure. That has been one of our challenges. We've been trying to get ourselves in different spaces, trying to ensure that we have coaches that meet a variety of needs because not everyone wants to wants help for professional or personal development. Some persons want it for health, some persons might want it for fitness, finances, performance. It varies for everyone. I enjoy working at my own pace. I tend to get things done in intervals. So I'm able to wake up at 5.30, um, do some work, take a break 
from like 12 back to 2 and then work again. So I like the freedom to work at my own pace when the inspiration strikes and even when some determination is needed when motivation fails. But just the freedom of doing it. Just do it. <laughs> so even though Janesco is relatively new, it's not my first venture. I've tried several different business that have some have failed some have succeeded but it's about just doing it just do it regardless of the risk regardless of how you're feeling if you might not be experienced you might not feel ready but just do it regardless and trial and error work it out as you want so we are have been experimenting a bit with how individuals use art to express themselves when words fail. So we've actually partnered with House of Flames um, to do an uh, art exhibit, showcase live performances, the whole work, all different aspects of art, just have individuals come and show what they have. We do it the last Sunday of each month. Um, we just try to relax, unwind, do something different. Just express yourself. As I said before, when words fail, art steps in. So you can either visit our website at janesco.com, so that's J-A-N-E-X-C-O.com, or you can follow us on social media at Janesco, or give us a call or a WhatsApp message at 876-488-2444. So that's three fours at the end. <laughs> Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Friday, June 30, the US dollar sold for an average of $154.62. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $117.52. The pound sterling traded for $197.24. And the euro sold for $171.42. In GSE trading, the GSE index advanced by 1,645 points. The junior market index advanced by 24 points. The combined market index advanced by 1,755 points. And the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 2,559 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 107 stocks of which 50 advanced, 40 declined, and 17 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited Variable Preference, Access Financial Services Limited, and Barita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for Cargo Handlers Limited, Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited, and Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited. Trading firm were 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, and Epley Limited 7.75% preference shares. The overall volume leaders were Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 9 million units, One on One Educational Services Limited with over 5 million units, and Spur Tree Spices Jamaica Limited with over 4 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Calista Macro Index Fund posted a volume of 280 shares. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, zero securities traded. In regional business, the Guyanese government is looking to stimulate small business development across the country by doling out about 1.8 billion Guyanese dollars in financial support to thousands of small business owners. This is according to Vice President Dr. Barat Jadeo. We reform that program and we reduce the sum so that more people can benefit. And we prohibited members of parliament from getting any money from this grant. So that is a separate grant that's a, through the former SLED program that is the one I'm talking about. If you live in Burbies or Region 2 or Region 3 or in the East Coast or Region 10. You, we haven't done it as yet. It would be done over the course of the <coughs> next few months. Separately, there has been this Small Business Bureau grant that is <coughs> administered through 
minister on Asia's ministry. And um, on that grant, they had, <coughs> they had um, collected applications from 2021. So a number of people been calling, and they have a more elaborate process there. Get cash flow, records, a whole range of stuff. Get NIS compliance, very burdensome. And it's a trouble for many small people. So we now decided there are 700 odd, maybe nearly 800 outstanding applications there. People still have expectations. So they're all, we've decided they would all get some grant through that ministry. And they have a pool of money and those people will receive. Those are separate too. But they came through a different stream, through a, a different application stream for the grant. So I want those who had applied to the Small Business Bureau to know that we have addressed that concern. In international business, data showed Wall Street closed higher over the weekend to end the second quarter and the first half of the year. U.S. stocks closed higher on Friday to end the second quarter and the first half of the year. The Dow on Friday rose eight-tenths of one percent. The S&P 500 gained 1.2%. And the Nasdaq climbed nearly one and a half percent. For the January to June period, the tech heavy Nasdaq finished up more than 31 percent, its biggest gain in the first half of the year in 40 years, as inflation showed signs of cooling. A Commerce Department report out Friday tracking a key inflation measure closely watched by the Federal Reserve showed price increases grew at a slower pace in May versus April and are now below 4 percent. The data fueled hopes the Fed could be near the end of its rate hiking cycle. But Retirement Planning of America founder and CEO Ken Morafe says he thinks the Fed has a way to go before it finishes raising rates this year, which will cause turbulence in the markets. We see the CPI continuing to uh, bottoming out here in, in July at under three and a half percent, but then starting to trend back up towards four percent. Then that bodes for the Fed raising interest rates more than two times in the balance of this year. And, and it also bodes for the Fed not lowering interest rates until next year. That being the case, the bond market hasn't priced that in. We don't think the stock market has. And that's going to cause the turbulence that I'm talking about and why we think that there's going to be buying opportunities along the way when we get that turbulence. In terms of individual stocks, Nike fell close to 3% after it forecast first quarter revenue below Wall Street expectations. Shares of Carnival, which notched their best month and quarter on record, jumped nearly 10% on Friday after Jefferies upgraded the cruise operator's stock to buy from hold. And shares of Apple jumped more than 2% as the iPhone maker returned to a $3 trillion market valuation. In market data for oil, oil rose after top exporters Saudi Arabia and Russia announced supply cuts for August, overshadowing concern over a global economic slowdown. Brent crude futures were up 32 cents at $75.73 a barrel, and West Texas Intermediate crude rose 32 cents to $70.96. And that was the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, Antigua and Barbuda's Prime Minister Gaston Brown says some countries in the region have acted in a way to destroy Antigua-based airline Liat. He is also concerned that some CARICOM countries, quote, want it all, end quote, and should temper their ambition, as he points to insularity in the regional bloc. Garfield Burford reports. Prime Minister Brown says the community is yet to harness the full potential of the regional services sector. That's despite services accounting for the lion's share of economic activity across CARICOM. He points to the need to address regional transportation given the geographic spread of the member states and reaffirms this requires collaboration among the countries of CARICOM. I am of the view that in order to have sustained re regional transportation services that the government's must take some responsibility to develop a sustained regional or even sub-regional carrier to supplement CAL. This idea that we must depend exclusively 
on um, the private um, entities within the Caribbean. That is not a sustainable model. However, the Prime Minister says some leaders have not been singing off the same hymn sheet on the issue. Antigua and Barbuda has been providing aviation and aviation services or transportation services to the Caribbean region. And I find it untenable that despite the fact that the treaty calls for, uh, let's say, equitable benefits, that you have some countries within the region trying to not only compete, but to displace Antigua and Barbuda as a provider of transportation services. So instead of cooperating with um, Antigua and Barbuda to restore Liat, or for that matter, to start a completely new entity, you have countries going outside of the region to facilitate and to establish other private entities in order to literally destroy Liat. The Prime Minister makes it clear this runs counter to the ethos of regional integration. He didn't name the countries, but it's clear he was referring to some of the more developed countries or MDCs within Garicom. You can have it all. You can be, for example, the provider of um, goods to Antigua and Barbuda, in which we probably spend at least $120 million a year buying goods from Caribbean countries. But on the other hand, you want to also decimate our small transportation sector. That is not in keeping with the spirit of the Treaty of Shagaramas. And I want to call upon my colleagues to kind of, you know, manage the ambition to get to have everything. You can't have everything. As he did at the flag raising ceremony on Tuesday, the Prime Minister has again raised concern about actions of some member states and the community who are undermining the progress of the less developed countries or LDCs. The head of government makes it clear, though, that the Twin Islands state remains rooted to the integration project. The High Commission of Canada, through the Canada Fund for Local Initiatives, donated over 80,000 Canadian dollars to the Grenada Planned Parenthood Association and Grenchap Inc. The funds will be used to strengthen sexual and gender-based violence services in Grenada and increase public awareness of human rights through community outreach. The 49905 Canadian dollars awarded to the Grenada Planned Parenthood Association will initiate a one-step centre for sexual and gender-based violence survivors in Grenada. The centre will provide a safe space for persons who have experienced sexual and gender-based violence to access client-centred medical and social services. This funding will also support the training of the Grenada Planned Parental Association clinical staff and hospital health care providers in survivor-focused care, as well as contribute to upgrading facilities at the designated centre. The Canadian $32,715 donated to Grand Chap Inc. will facilitate a training program and communications campaign aimed at building awareness around human rights and sexual gender-based violence in Grenada. Fifteen community mobilizers will benefit from the training on Grenada's Domestic Violence Act 2010 and the social and emotional learning in 14 community forums across Grenada, Caricou and Piti Martinique. The Canada Fund for Local Initiative is a program designed to support small-scale high-impact projects in developing countries that aligned with the Government of Canada's thematic priority areas for engagement. High Commissioner of Canada, H. E. Lillian Chatterjee in her remarks said, and I quote, Grenada is pleased to continue its partnership with the Grenada Planned Parenthood Association and the Grand Chap Inc., two organizations committed to building a safer, more inclusive Grenada for all. Understanding the importance of working collaboratively with local government partners to protect and empower the most vulnerable members of society, unquote. Grenada Planned Parenthood Association and Grand Chap Inc., are two of many civil society organizations across four eligible countries in the Eastern Caribbean, which was successful in the 2023-2024 CFLI project, which administers 300,000 Canadian dollars in available funding this year. Rina P. Thomas, GBN News. Outgoing U.S. Ambassador to Guyana, Sarah Ann Lynch, has expressed tremendous pride in being able to partner with Guyana and play a key role in the country's development. During a ceremony held on Thursday evening in an early celebration of America's independence anniversary, Ambassador Lynch expressed that the team at the U.S. Embassy is dedicated to strengthening its partnership with the government, private sector, and civil society. Together, we have worked in the area of governance to build the capacity of key institutions, 
We've partnered in the commercial area to see our bilateral trade triple over the past few years. And we have worked on critical issues in the area of security to ensure that Guyana is a secure nation where citizens feel safe and investments are protected. She also congratulated Guyana on the commencement of its historic gas to energy project and for securing its seat on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. These are strong signs, ladies and gentlemen, of confidence by the international community that Guyana wants to contribute to regional and global efforts to strengthen international partnership, the rule of law, and to promote peace and stability around the globe. She also noted that Guyana is on a unique journey and committed to continuing to assist the country as it develops. I could not be prouder of our enduring partnership between our two nations, which I know will continue long past my tenure in Guyana. In international news, the Wagner Group says it has stopped recruiting mercenaries in Russia for at least a month. The Kremlin says it will not affect operations in Ukraine and that the compulsory recruitment of new soldiers will not be needed. Al Jazeera has the details. The announcement that Wagner suspends the recruitment of mercenaries for a month recently appeared in the company's Telegram channel in the job advertisement section in particular. According to the announcement, the reason to stop recruiting was due to Wagner's temporary non-participation in the special military operation in Ukraine, as they put it, and its current transfer to the Republic of Belarus. Therefore, they wrote that they were temporarily suspending the work of regional recruitment centers for a period of one month. But of course, we'll have to wait and see how it's going to play out. Earlier, President of Belarus, Lukashenko, confirmed that the Wagner Group would no longer be based in Russia. In some Russian cities, posters with calls to join the Wagner Group were replaced with other posters with an invitation to sign a contract and serve in the regular Russian army. Uh, by the way, there were also reports that Prigozhin's another massive asset, his media empire, is coming to an end too. Uh, Prigozhin was building it for at least 10 years, but now its websites are being blocked and its offices are being searched. There are many reports that employees of those media sources are being fired now. That's despite earlier reports that probably all those people would remain in their positions and their news outlets would be transferred to another owner. Uh, journalists used to call Prigozhin's media resources his troll factory. Uh, its employees used to write comments in support of the authorities, criticize the opposition and promote the so-called patriotic views. Uh, also interesting that in February 2018, the U.S. Department of Justice accused Prigozhin of interfering in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. And after that, the state imposed personal sanctions against Prigozhin. So what the future holds for Prigozhin, his Wagner group and his media empire, including the troll factory? We're waiting for updates to answer those questions. In sports, Jamaica ended the first round of the CONCACAF Gold Cup tournament on top. They dismissed St. Kitts and Nevis 5-0 with six new starters in the team on Sunday. The Reggae Boys finished second in the group on goal difference behind the USA who defeated Trinidad and Tobago 6-0 after both ended on seven points. The US have a plus 12 goal difference while Jamaica have plus eight. Jamaica will play the winners of Group D in the quarterfinals. And that's the news on PBCJ. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thanks so much for watching.